Hello, my name is Alicia Mays, and I want to welcome you to the Orchard Church. We are so glad that you decided to join us today. Many of you have been asking for more information, so here's a few ways that you can connect with us. When we can't meet together in person, we can do the next best thing and connect virtually. The Orchard Church has an active online presence via Facebook, and you can find us in two different areas for two different reasons. The first is at the Orchard Carbondale. This Facebook page is to find out about upcoming church events and most likely where you are watching today's sermon. The second Facebook platform is at The Orchard Group. Here in this group, this is where we dive deeper. We connect through Bible studies, prayer, and other special presentations. So give us a like and check out what our church is doing online. Speaking of what we are doing, we have a daily Bible study, Monday through Friday, that is live at 11 a.m. in The Orchard Facebook group. You can join us live or you can watch at a later time when you have 15 minutes free. This is a great way to learn how to read and apply the Word of God. We have been gathering every Wednesday at noon for almost a year to pray for God to do amazing things in our lives. And this didn't stop because of the pandemic. We are still praying and you can join us virtually again on the Orchard Facebook group Wednesdays at noon. The Orchard also offers free counseling for anyone who would benefit. So whether you're needing to talk to someone about anxiety, negative emotions, spiritual growth, marital or relationship wisdom, you can email Pastor Doug. If you're interested in joining the Orchard family or getting involved, please visit our website, theorchardlife.com. And as always, we don't pass the plate for tithes and offerings, but your giving is still funding our ministry and fueling our vision. You can visit our website or text Orchard Life to the number 77977. If you have any questions about The Orchard or would like to be contacted, please email us at office at theorchardlife.com. Again, I'm so happy that you are here, and we hope that you will join us by loving God and loving people, especially through this time. Know that we are here for you and would love to connect with you. Enjoy. Hi everyone, it's me, Pastor Stacy. I hope you are having a beautiful day so far. I just want to take just a minute of your time to tell you something exciting that's going to be happening at Kid Mountain. The week of June 8th, we are going to have our very first ever virtual Orchard Kids Club. That means that we are going to be doing everything online. This is going to be such a fun experience for the entire family. I hope that you guys will join us. We're going to have games, snacks, activities, crafts with these things. I bet you've got a few of these lying around your house, right? Worship and Bible stories. The entire week we are going to be learning how to focus on Jesus instead of the things around us and how that will help us have the best life ever. I hope that you and your family will take the time to go to theorchardlife.com and register for this event. Be checking your emails for more information. Have a great day. Hey, welcome to The Orchard. We're glad you joined us today. Whether this is your first time or whether you've been tracking with us, we are glad you are here. I want to tell you a story that happened about a decade ago. You see, I was dating this girl and it was getting serious. I mean, like, marriage serious. But prior to that, I had gone through some experiences in the years before that that were really hurting our relationship and our dynamic. It got to the point where we didn't know if we could move ahead because of what had happened in my past. Something had to change. Either I had to be willing to let go of some things or we would let go of this relationship. I mean, have you ever been right on the edge of something wonderful only to have something terrible happen? Maybe something from your past. Maybe some habitual sin that that just always seems to creep back. Perhaps some old pattern that, that just continually holds you back. There's nothing worse than having the life you've always wanted, like right there in sight, but to be held back by your own dysfunction or lack of devotion. Today's message is about this very thing. You see, God's people were on the border of the promised land. They could see it, but before they could cross over into it, something very important had to happen. And it's something that we most often overlook. 
And if you're watching or if, you, or if you're listening today and you've tried Christianity or the church and it just never seemed to work for you, well, today's message might be the very reason that you left the faith or that you left the church or that maybe you did neither of those things, but your faith is anemic. So, in fact, whether you're a skeptic today or whether you're a seasoned veteran, today's message is about an overlooked word that carries amazing amounts of power in our lives. Without this, there would be no promised land. Without this, I wouldn't have married that girl and have the life that I do today. So track with me as we look forward and we look at this word that has the power to transform your relationship with God your faith, and your life. And it sets you up for crossing over into the promised land. Because today, we're moving from the wilderness of the past to the promise of the future. We pick up our series with Joshua replacing Moses and leading God's people you know, out of captivity, through the wilderness, all the way up to the border of the promised land. And their new leader, Joshua, well, he's on week one of his leadership. And the people of God find themselves camped on the boundary of the land that was promised to them. They're camped in, in sight of the promised land. And between them is this river, Jordan. Soon they'll leave their old life. Uh, and they've come from captivity. They've, they've wandered in the wilderness. And finally, they're going to have the life they wanted. But just before they cross over the river Jordan, God tells his people to do something. It's just one word in this account, in one verse that's easy to miss. We have this one sentence, and if you blink or don't pay attention, you'll, you'll just move right past it. But here it is, Joshua 3, verse 5. God says, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. I love that verse. Now, if you're like me, you're drawn to the last half of it, the last part. The, the Lord is going to do amazing things among you. I want that. I want to hear that. As a pastor, as a person, I pray for that. I want to see, see uh, healings, both physically and emotionally and mentally. I want to see God bring freedom to addictions and vices. I want to see God bring grace and love to, to marriages and rebuilding broken relationships and forgiving of sins and creating new destinies. And I want to see miraculous signs and wonders. I read that verse and I think, yes, God, do amazing things in us and through us. You see, but I have this, I've been feeling God lead me in this sermon to, to not focus on that second part of it, but to, to scoot back and focus on the first part, the, the part that's forgettable, the part that we don't get excited about. And, and the part, if we're honest, we probably really don't understand what it means. He says, consecrate yourselves. I mean, yeah. Give me that consecration. What is it? What does it even mean? I mean, I mean, if God just told you right now, go consecrate yourself, what would you do? Like, what would you go do? Do you even know? Consecration sounds like secretion and concentration got in a relationship. Like, I don't even know what that means, but apparently when, when, when it's done, we get to do amazing things and God's going to do great things in us and through us. Consecration. The final thing Joshua and God's people are told before they enter the promised land is to consecrate themselves. I wonder if they just stood around looking at each other, like wondering what it means like we do. You look at your neighbor and you go, well, you heard him. Go ahead, start consecrating. And you just kind of watch, hoping that you'll figure it out as you go. The poet Robert Van Winkle wrote a sonnet about this. He said, stop consecrate and listen. And here in Joshua 3, verse 5, what's he saying? What does he mean to consecrate? Well, I'm glad that you're pining for this, this information as much as I'm ready to give it to you. This next part might seem a little bit of a word study, but I want you to know that the word consecrate might be the very element that's missing from your spiritual life, from your life as a whole. I mean, look where God positioned consecration. First, consecrate yourself. Then I'm going to do amazing things in your life. Listen, we all want the amazing things. We all want God to do those things in us and through us. So, so, perhaps, we should, so perhaps we should just pay some attention to this, this word he says here before that. 
Perhaps learning what it means to consecrate is a worthy pursuit, no? You see, the word consecrate has Latin roots. By co- con- combining the words con and sacare, you get this, this word that means to devote yourself, to make sacred. And the Hebrew word that they use here is kadash. And it means to also to devote oneself. But it has so many more layers in it and through it. Consecrate is used over 200 times in the Old Testament. And it's most often God telling his people, go consecrate. This is a directive that God continually rolls out in requests of his people. And if you're listening today, this is something God invites you into that will radically change your spiritual reality. This may very well be the seismic spiritual shift that you've been looking for in your life. This word may be the thing you didn't even know you were missing. Think of how important it is. I mean, God's people don't cross the promised land until they've first stopped and camped and consecrated themselves. They don't step into the destination of their destiny until they've consecrated their lives. It has something to do with their what they do now for their future. I mean, God has something big for them, the promised land. But, But God calls them to something bold in the present. We often long so much for those big, amazing things in the future. We look for them, we we beg for them, we plead for them, but we miss this present calling. Consecrate yourselves. The Lord wants to do amazing things among you. Man, we want that second half of the verse. But today, let's look at that first part. You see, consecrate means to, to set yourself aside as sacred. Consecrate means to to separate yourself from the things that are unpleasing to God. And consecrate means to devote yourself fully to following God. Catch this. Before God would lead them into a new season, he wanted to get that old season out of them. It's hard to thrive in a new season when you're living in old sin. And before God would let them cross into the promised land, he wanted to purify their sinful hearts. And for us, I mean, we have a new season ahead. God has a new season for you ahead. And God wants you to leave your old sin behind. We have a holy promised land ahead. And we need to leave our our sin problem behind. As we look ahead to to new horizons of what's going to be next, we need to drop some old habits. We need new ways out of sinning so we can have a new season of thriving. You know, when it comes to our sin, we're all so unique and and, and the details of our sin is gory, but, but we have to remember that it's all covered by God's story and God's glory. So so consecrate yourselves. Let's step into this. Set yourself apart from the things that hold you back. To consecrate something, well, that means to devote it to God. And today, we need to to reconsider devoting ourselves to God. This is something that is a challenge for each of us. See, you may believe in Jesus. Are you following Jesus? Are you devoted to Him? Have you consecrated your life to be devoted to following Him in His ways, on His path? Because the truth is this, if you're not purposely following Jesus, you may need to look up to see who and what you are following. Most often in life, without intentionally staying on God's path, we get off of it. And the result is two options. The first is we coast. That's our lack of pursuit. We coast. Spiritual apathy. The second one is we drift. And that's we pursue the wrong things. And that's moral apathy. Coasting. That's when you've stopped pursuing God. And when you coast, which direction do you always coast? Always downhill. You never coast uphill. So you see, we want to follow Jesus into higher and higher levels of maturity and faith. But when we coast, we don't coast into higher levels of faith and maturity. 
We coast downhill. We co- without consecrating ourselves, without devoting ourselves to that pursuit, we coast towards further spiritual immaturity and weaker faith. And what about drifting? I mean, we're still pursuing something, right? But drifting is the pursuit of the things that God would ask us not to. And consecration is seeing where you're coasting and seeing where you're drifting and readjusting your life to pursue God fully. Consecration before they entered the promised land. Consecration is devotion to God. In fact, Jesus talks about this in Mark 1, verse 17 and 18. Jesus says, he says, come follow me. I will make you fishers of men. The next line says, at once they dropped their nets and they followed him. He calls his, pres- his, his disciples into the promised land, a new way of living, a promised life. He says, come follow me. And what was the first thing they had to do before they followed him? What was the first thing these guys did? It says that once they dropped their nets and followed him. Now, now what were their nets? Well, they're fishermen. Their nets are their old life. They had to leave their old ways behind. They had to follow Jesus in a new way ahead. And they had to drop their nets to follow what's next. Can you imagine this scene if it hadn't happened like this? Let me paint it for you. You know, Jesus is out there on the countryside and he's preaching, powerful preaching. And he's doing miracles and and people are getting healed. And and as he he speaks, lives are changing. And he, he turns to this young man. This young man who is enmeshed in his own way of living, he's, he's holding his fishing nets. And, and, and their nets back then, their nets weren't like our fly fishing nets we have. We, you hold with one hand. These are big nets that they would cast and it would make a, a wide area. Big, heavy nets. Well, this, this young man who Jesus turns to, his, his life is a fisherman. I mean, he's dressed for the job. He's tired from this job. He's covered in his job and he... He smells like his job. I mean, he's a fisherman. And Jesus looks him in the eye and says, You, I have a new life for you. I have a new destiny, a promised land. Come, follow me. And this young man, his eyes light up and his slack jaw at the thought of being invited by Jesus to follow him and be a disciple turns into a grin. He looks around at his condition. He's standing in a boat holding a slimy, smelly fishing net covered in scales and and muck. But he has a new life ahead. He's called to the promised land. He can't wait, so he accepts the invitation. He says, I'm with you, Jesus. I'm ready for that promised life. I'm ready for the destiny you have for me. I'm going to follow you. He steps out of that boat. He, He leaves that boat behind, and he starts to follow Jesus. Only one problem. He doesn't drop his nets. He just carries them with him. He doesn't let go. He he doesn't consecrate. He doesn't separate himself. He doesn't leave behind his old life. He starts to follow Jesus, and behind him is this giant fishing net that just drags on the ground and gets covered in more dust and dirt on the road behind him, and it gets heavier and heavier because sin never leaves me with less baggage. Sin never leaves me better than it found me. It never gets easier. The nets of my old life and my sin, the more I drag them, the more they gather baggage and weight and wounds and hurts and hurting those I love. More habits and stronger vices and new addictions. You know, this fisherman's trying to follow Jesus, but he's getting tired. He thinks, this following Jesus is harder than I thought. His neck gets caught on something. He has to to yank it and jerk it, and he's falling behind. His smile of joy of following Jesus is replaced by just a grimace of effort. He thinks to himself, this isn't what I thought it would be. I was promised a new life. I was promised peace and, and power and presence, and I'm just miserable. He smells as bad as he ever did. He's more tired than he was before. He has no joy in the Lord. Following Jesus is more of a a chore than a joy. He finally stops, old net in hand. He looks up to the promised path before him that Jesus walks. 
This isn't what I signed up for. This whole Christianity thing is a joke. And he heads back to his boat, nets still intact, and returns to his old life. And when someone mentions Jesus or the church or Christianity, he smirks and declares, I tried that once. I grew up in that, yeah. It's not what you think. It's just stuffy, religious, exhausting. What about you? I mean, you may have tried this God thing before. You may have been raised in it. You may have given it a go after a rousing sermon or a moment of crisis. But you found it cumbersome. It was tiresome. And it was not at all what you were told it would be. Others may have smiled and pretended like it was good, but you didn't have their experience. For you, it was more struggle. It wasn't supernatural. It was miserable. And if that was you, and it, it very well could be, and if you look down in that season, you might see your hands tightly gripped around the nets of your old life. You may have tried to follow Jesus on a new path, but without consecration. You did it with your old sin and ways still in hand. You may have tried Jesus, but it wasn't what you thought. You, you tried it, it wasn't what they said it would be. And the whole time, behind you, drag it on the ground, your old life, you're just carrying it with you. You see, you, we can't follow Jesus in a new way today with the old life of yesterday holding us back. And for any of you watching or listening who've, who've tried to forge a new life with God while clinging to your old sin and way of living, listen to this verse, Hebrews 12, 1. It might let you know what's been happening or what did happen. He says, let us throw off, let's throw off or, or let us put down anything, everything, that holds us back, and any sin that easily entangles or trips us up. That sounds like somebody carrying a net of their old life. And he says here to, to throw it off, cast it aside, put it down, drop it, consecrate. You see, you can't follow Jesus into the promised life while hanging on to your old sinful nets and selfish habits. And Joshua, and the people of God, they couldn't enter the promised land while still hanging on to their old life. In Joshua 3, 5, God tells them to consecrate themselves. Separate yourself from your sin. Devote yourself to following God. And then, well, then they would follow God into the promised land. And the disciples, they had to consecrate themselves and, and drop their nets, drop their old life before following Jesus on the path that he set for them. And, and you and me, we need to pause and take a look at our lives. Because many of us miss this step or, or we forgot and we need to go back. We need to consecrate ourselves, separate ourselves from the, the habitual or the secret sins that hold us back. You see, those secret and habitual sins, they're not going to keep God from loving you. They're not going to keep God from forgiving you, but they will entangle you. They will weigh you down. And you were not meant to go in the promised land or the promised life, still holding those smelly and heavy nets of your old self. For us, like Joshua, before we move forward, we need to pause, consecrate, and ask, what nets am I still carrying from my old life? What sins do I continue to drag with me on this journey? What old life have I refused to lay down? Maybe it's time. It's a great season to do this. To drop some old habits. To bring some secret sins to light. To confess, to repent, to change, and turn from some habitual vices. Or perhaps, maybe, you did lay them down at one point. But at some later date, you went back and, and picked them right back up. I've been there. And the good news is that Jesus is loving and gracious, and he forgives us. And it doesn't matter if you went and picked up those nets an hour ago or 20 years ago. He loves you, and he desires freedom for you. 
And the Bible says, it says this, there is zero, zero condemnation in or from Jesus for those who want to return to him. So if you look down and you see that, that a net in your hand of your old life and sin, of a habitual and secret sin, you, you ask his forgiveness. You, you confess it to him and drop it and move forward. There's no need to punish yourself. And there is zero requirement for penance because Jesus paid it all on the cross. Jesus paid our penance for us. Joshua and God's people were on the border of the promised land, but before they could enter, God wanted them to take care of some things first. Consecrate yourselves, for the Lord is going to do amazing things in your life. Consecrate. Devote your life to God. Pursue Him. Don't coast. Don't drift. Consecrate yourself from your old sin and ways. Drop your nets. Drop your old life. Put those secret and habitual sins behind you because the Lord is going to do amazing things in your life. You see, the reality is your relationship with God won't move forward without this vital step. I mentioned to you in the beginning about how Amy and I were dating uh, with the intent to marry. You see, but I had been through that very painful and breaking season of life prior to meeting her. I had been wounded so deeply by somebody I trusted, and it had given me baggage that I had never carried before. And my wife, she's the, she's the strongest and most loving heart I know, and I'll never forget what she said to me one day in that season. She said it courageously, and she said it compassionately. She said, I feel like it's not just you and me in this relationship. I was like, what? I, I got defensive. I was like, I, I'm not cheating. Are you saying there's somebody else? And she said, no. She made it clear. It's, I know you're not. But, but you're still carrying your past distrust into our present. You're bringing your old hurt into our new hope. And if you want this relationship to move forward, you've got to decide to leave that behind. You see, there's not enough room for me and your past. <sighs> for our relationship to move forward, I had to drop some old patterns, some old resentments. I had to let go of some old experiences that had entangled my heart. And for you today, God would say to you, I love you. There's nothing you've done that can separate you from my love. No, no, you need to hear that again. God would say, there's nothing you've done that separates you from my love. But, but if we're going to move forward together, you need to leave some of those old ways behind. There's not enough room in your heart for you to truly, fully love me and follow me and hold on to those things that hurt you and hold you back. This is the heart of consecration. Letting go of what holds you back so that you can love and trust God in a new way moving ahead. Consecrate yourselves, for the Lord wants to do amazing things in and through you. You see, the wilderness prepares you for the promised land. But consecration, it positions you to move in to the promised land. And here's the challenge today. What do you need to lay down? Like, like what, do you need to, what do you need to lay down so that you can move forward? What has always held you back? You know what it is. What do you know you need to drop? What are you carrying into your relationship with God that you need to separate from? so you can fully move forward with him and trust? It's big questions. It's questions that you need to answer with God. What nets are you carrying? Because for God to call us into the promised land, the second half of that verse is true. The God wants to do amazing things in you and through you. But that's part two of the verse. And so today I want you to wrestle with part one. 
where do you need to consecrate yourself? What do you need to set your heart free from so you can fully devote your heart to God? We have some practical help for you if you need it. You see, for for some of us, our nets so entangle our lives that, that we don't even know how to get out. And so for you, maybe we have some things to offer you. At the Orchard, we provide free counseling on this very thing. It doesn't matter if you're right here local or if you're across the nation who's been tuning in. We, we offer some free virtual counseling for you about these entangling nets and what it means to consecrate your life. We've actually also started a Celebrate Recovery ministry for freedom from addiction, any kind of addiction that it would be. And for anyone, we offer prayer and community, authentic relationships and acceptance. I mean, our church vision is love God and love people. And we always say there's no asterisk after love God or love people. We love all people. And we want to, have, we want to love God without condition. So, it doesn't matter what hardships or what hurts you come from. We want to be here to help you. And if, if you find that you need some, some of these resources on your journey, if you want some counseling or you want to join Celebrate Recovery or one of our groups or just talk to somebody or get some prayer, I want you to visit us at theorchardlife.com. We'd love to, to hear from you. You can message us here on Facebook or on, the, on YouTube, however you get to that. The Wilderness and the Promised Land series. I mean, we've been in this for two months. It was 40 years for them in the Bible, and two months isn't too bad. But next week, next week, don't miss, because we are going to cross the Jordan, and we're going to enter the promised land. And next week, you'll be challenged and inspired by a whole new invitation on how to walk boldly in faith and gratitude for God. So I challenge you to come back next week. It's going to be a great week. Until then, I want you to know I love you and I'm praying for you. Love God and love people.